Hello, hello, hello. How are you? And I do hope you are doing well. Once again, here we are. Early in the morning, 6.49, January 30th, one day before the last day of the month. Seems like time went away real quick. <laughs> Woo. Nevertheless, continuing with me, who am I? I told you I was going to get back to telling you more about who I am so you can know more about who is this man in Israel talking to you about who he is. All right, so let's go. Oh, hey, don't forget to subscribe, okay? Hit the like button and smash that bell so you can get all the notifications when I drop these videos. All right, so let's go back into my childhood. I told you I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, 1961, July 24. Grady Memorial Hospital had an annex named Hugh Spaulding. And that's where I was born, in Hugh Spaulding. Grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, doing things, typical, you know, young son. And um, played football, elementary school. I went to Ma Baker Daycare Center over there in People's Town. Okay. When I came in the world, we was living in People's Town, a street uh, the address was 171 Tuskegee Street. And then time went on, we moneyed up. And my parents, they, you know, started their business, got money real good. And we moved out to the west side where bigger houses, more affluence was at, you know, because they had that kind of paper. So, went to a day, daycare center over there. His name Ma Baker. I remember that little place. I used to enjoy it. Believe it or not, you know, I was a little bit of guy. But I remember Ma Baker Daycare Center. Now this is some serious, organic, pure, 100 percent Atlanta history. People town, man, you got to really have been from Atlanta to know about people town primrose circles and all over in there so anyway growing up in Atlanta was cool you know for me I really had no problems like that you know we came from that side where money was more abundant we had a lot of everything so I remember I was telling you about being a DJ and that story got so good it ended up me, me telling you about how I was selling candy in school and making all that money every day so I feel it's only fair to tell you about my DJing <laughs> being a DJ oh boy was I good it started in high school actually Harper High, and that was uh, 3399 Collier Drive, Atlanta, Georgia. That was Harper High. They, the school was, we had over 4,000 students. We had a mean football team, basketball team, because, you know, we had a lot of children to pull from. And I, I did start out telling, I worked in the audiovisual department, and I told you how I put those two box record players together through the uh, gym PA system that was just absolutely loud. Well, nevertheless, that went on to get me more work DJing because when the children saw me do it like that, now they started requesting me to be at their parties in different places. So anyway, that's what I started doing. 
Remember I told you about, I sold the candy and I went to my mother to get the rest of the money I needed to buy the rest of the equipment. And she saw me with all that money and she gave me the rest of the money. And I bought all this nice equipment. Technique 1200 turntable, new mark mixer, Sir and Vega speakers. But now here's the deal, Radio Shack back in those days, they sold some uh, floor speaker, had a 12 inch woofer, a mid-range horn and a tweeter. And those speakers sounded good. The 12 inch woofer, man, they bang it out. And I got a, uh, my first mixer was a Fisher. It was a Fisher mixer, about four, 500 watts. And that was good enough for the size parties I started out doing, house parties and kind of like small to medium venues. And when you place your speakers right, you can get some banging sound. And I did. And so I started doing house parties it was like every weekend they'd pay me to do house party. And you know, at that I don't remember exactly how much I would get paid, but it was nice. Cause I, you know, I never, I, I was just always, you know, collecting the money and it was cool. I didn't have any problem with what I was making. I was satisfied with what they was giving me. And uh, I partied. Then they had a, uh, you know, back in those days, music came on wax records. You know, me being born in the 60s, they had the 45 players, you know, for those of you all that remember, used to get these records that was 45s. And then you had to get these plastic inserts to go on the inside of the uh, 45 records you would pop them in there. Some people could hold them in their hand and put these little plastic insert. Other people lay them down on some flat surface and just push them in there. And then you can put it on the record player on that silver spindle, uh, that silver thing sticking up the middle. And you could just stack a bunch of 45s on there and just play a whole bunch of 45s. And that's some old school stuff for you, y'all. Some of y'all don't have absolutely not a clue of what I'm talking about, 45s, you know? Yeah, but they came on those little 45 records. And you know, you if you've been on YouTube listening to music, you've seen them. And you've seen albums. Some of you all have never held, held a wax album record ever in your hand. Because you was born in that time, CDs. Then you got the USB sticks and them guys is DJing with laptop computers. But we come from that crew where you had the record disc, the LP, and we call it a wax, you know. You put the needle in the groove and get it to move, you know. And so, you know, in those days, they had this, uh, you know, you could go to the record shop and by all the hottest songs came out, you know, the latest song that dropped. You go buy the record, a few dollars, you know. You can take it home, put it on your box. And because I was so into music and sound, I became what you call the audio folly. Those type guys was like geeks in the music and sound. You know, you, you looking for the best possible sound. You know, I went to the Fry Institute of Technology and that's when my technical skills just blasted off, shot to the stratosphere. But even before DeVry, you know, I had a real good understanding of equipment, sound, because I partnered up with a brother named Jimmy Scott. And he was he was from Decatur, Georgia. And me and him partnered up. The way I hooked up with him is we had a McDonald's in the neighborhood. You know, our neighborhood McDonald's, they was doing, the children was up there doing a uh, fundraiser. And uh, the children was doing a fundraiser. 
and Jimmy Scott was providing the music. And so, so I was up at the McDonald's. See what 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 uh what caught my attention. See this car in front of me, jumped in front of me, and you know they drive and just don't be conscious, man, and be all in your way. You know, and they go just fast enough to be in your way and slow enough to, to bother your your rhythm. Then when you try to go around, you see they speed up. It's aggravating. And then the company, the car is from the same company I'm, I'm with. It's one of the one of the people that work for the same company. And I just saw a look in the mirror to realize, you know. Anyway, forget that. So, um, at the McDonald, Jimmy Scott was sitting there, and he had some records. Had a little turntable and a big old speaker. And it was about the raggedest, pitiful looking setup you want to see. Because the speaker he was playing out of was a big Fender speaker for the keyboard. Sound was loud. It was alright. It wasn't no, you know, nothing right home about. And so I sat down with the brother, you know. He had some record little turntable. He was sitting there. And I got to talking with him, chopping it up. Next thing you know, he agreed to let me work with him. So we started working together. He had a microphone. And I started working that mic. And he saw I had a talent, you know, a gift for gal. I'm on the mic, hey, who, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, we we did a lot of parties together. We named ourselves... uh, Earth Union Disco. And we did a bunch of parties all around Atlanta. And we get paid, you know, to do our thing. And I would go to all these shows. Now, when when our popularity grew, it was based upon my gift for Gab working the mic. So I, I I named myself DJ Smooth, you know, cause I was real smooth with the mic, talking smack, you know. People say I got a nice voice, and that was all good too. So me and Jimmy, we was all over Atlanta, and you know we make eight hundred dollars, thousand dollars. You know I remember because. You see, Jimmy, they was weed heads. Him and his people, you know, Cooper, Scott, and all them guys, they were real heavy weed heads. Smoked that weed, you know? And because I was the youngest guy in the crew, I didn't really have a lot of juice to say, you know, what should happen. So, the reason why I remember exactly how much we were getting paid because Jimmy would take the $800 and back in those days that's exactly what a pound of weed costs $800 and so he would say he gonna take the $800 buy the weed and flip it and double it and you could $1600 that was a good idea it was a good plan but what was the problem they were all weed heads so so you know we get the pound of weed but then them clowns wind up smoking a half a pound. And when you sell it, all you got is what? $800. You ain't, you ain't profiting nothing. And the jokers did that every single time. And I tried to tell them, I say, dude, man, you, we ain't going nowhere. Y'all take the money, buy a bag of weed, a pound of weed, and the money is tied up. I can't get no money because y'all going to double it. But then you don't wind up, that's it, Cooper. And Scott and you and your girl Cynthia, all y'all smoking up the weed, man. I said, we going absolutely nowhere. So I got real frustrated. But see, I was the, you know, the the headline. I mean, when I, when we go places, people be coming to see me. Young brother working that mic, talking that smack, you know, playing that music. So anyway, that's when... I knew I had to break off. 
So, yeah, I got my own business going. I called it EMF. I was in DeVry Institute of Technology, and I've been in there long enough to get a real good understanding of electricity, EMF, electromotive force, atoms, voltage, resistance, power, you know, all of that. So I started, I broke off and left in Jokers, and I told Scott, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy, I say, bro, man, we ain't going nowhere with this money, bro. Every time we do a show, we get paid, you buy a bag, bag a pound of weed, say you're going to flip it, double it, and we wind up where we at. And I ain't got no money because you got my money tied up in that pound of weed that y'all smoking. I said, I can't keep going like this, man. I ain't making no money, bro. He like, well, sick. so what's your plan? I said, I'm going to have to go and do my own thing, bro, because this ain't working for me. I'm working too hard and getting nothing. He said, hey, bro, you know, man, I got to make a decision. I said, I got to go and do my own thing. So I did. I got my equipment together, and I went out there, and I named my company EMF, Electromotive Force. With, with me and him, we was Earth Union Disco. But when I got out there, I was EMF, Electromotive Force, because that's the, uh, the technical name of voltage, the power to electricity, EMF, Electromotive Force. And so since I had all that equipment running electricity, I said, oh yeah, that'd be good. EMF was my company, Mobile Music and Sound. And when I got off to myself, my business just literally shot through the roof. Not only was I playing on the weekend, man, I was playing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That was time where I had shows every single day of the week. And then Sundays I would go and do like background music for some of these little affairs these women would have on Sunday after church. They wanted some, you know, some background music I and, 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 and I go do live for them get paid for that man I stay busy and the more work I did the more equipment I bought until I got to a point man I had so much equipment I had to hire a brother to help me move it and everywhere I went I took every single piece of equipment and then in Atlanta, they had this uh, company named Herschel Harrington Studios. Now, if any of you all listening that are actually from Atlanta and you was there back in those days, like 78, 79, around in there, in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, you had discos, you had, you know, clubs, the Limelight Disco, Mr. V's, Figure 8, you know, uh, uh, the one up there, 2000, up there in P Street, Piedmont. I think of it in a minute. You had Cisco's out there on Camerton Road, Marco's. I, I mentioned Mr. V's. You had Scats, uh, Club 131 downtown. And Scats and Club 131 was owned by the same dude, you know. And then they had another club down in Macon, Georgia. I used to go down there with them. You know, and uh, the owner of the, that look, uh, those chain, he had a chain of a, a nightclub disco. He liked me, you know, he really liked me. He told me he, he was thinking about making me the manager of the club down in Columbus, Georgia. I'm like, really, you know, but anyway, anyway, I was doing all these shows around Atlanta. And, uh, wow, <laughs> it's so much, you know. So, so I named myself EMF, Electromotive Force, DJ Smooth. And boy, was I busy. Wow, you know, I'm having to pick and choose because so much to tell you about that time period that a lot of people today, 70s and 80s, missed it all you know i'm looking at what we're doing today and it's nowhere near how we used to party you know they have clubs like they got a club here in in israel 
I went to. Matter of fact, I got to check, but it was a minute that I went to. It's called a G-Spot Club. They open like just on the weekend, like I think uh, Thursday and Friday or Friday and Saturday. I got to double check that, find out, you know. But the club life in Israel, it ain't nowhere near like it was back in the day. You know, the club be banging every night of the week. I used to go to the Limelight Disco up there in Atlanta, and they be banging seven days a week. House is packed. You know, just about all of them. You know, you had your happy hours up in there. You know, so anyway, I'm DJing, and I'm going to DeVry Institute of Technology. And I'm learning electronics and DJing. And I run into this brother up in uh, the school named Reginald Swindale. Never forget, I was sitting over there with, with people. We had just had a party the night before. And everybody was talking about, you know, how well the party was. And so this brother came in, new brother. And I had my back to the to the window, the glass, and everybody was kind of sitting around. I saw the brother come in the room. And, you know, he didn't know nobody. We didn't know nobody. We didn't know him. And so he kind of walked in and was kind of, you know, I mean, wait a minute. The room was a cafeteria, okay? It was a little small break room cafeteria. This is like when DeVry first started back in the 70s. What was that, you know? In the um, 70s, late 70s. And I did DeVry after I finished, after I left college up in um, John C. Smith University. I tell you about that another time when I was playing football. But I'm at DeVry now. And we sitting there in a little break room. And it was, you know, a bunch of children in there. Me, some of my friends. And we had had this party the night before. And I DJ, you know, we had a lot of fun. It was us. And so when Reginald Swindell walked in, he overheard us talking about this party. And then when they was asking me about the DJ and I was explaining them some things, this brother walked up, he said, Oh, you DJ, you do parties? And I looked and I looked at him like, at first I was like, dude, you kind of rude, you out of pocket. You know, you jumping up in our conversation like that. And so everybody looked around at him like, what, who is this guy? You are busting the conversation like, oh, you do parties, you a DJ? And I looked at him and you know, everybody kind of like paused for a minute and we saw it was a new dude, so you kind of feel the energy. We all gave him a pass. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm a DJ. He said, yeah, he said, I'm a DJ also. I said, hey, that's cool. That's cool. Where you from, bro? He said, I'm from New York. I think he said he was from Queens or somewhere around up in there. I said, oh, that's straight, man. That's straight. And he was in the same, you know, uh, course we was in electronic technician technologists like that and so you know we let the brothers sit down or well, just started school we were we wasn't you know all like that so he began to hunt, hang out with us and then i did another party the following weekend and he asked could he come because you know he dj i'm like yeah bro why not you know it's, i mean everybody gonna be there so we had the party, he came, and you know, I got my turntables, a mixer, and you know, I'm doing my little thing, and that's what I said, I'm doing my little thing. And the brother asked, could he play a little bit? Like, give me a break. I'm like, yeah, dude, why not? Yeah, go ahead, man, you know, you, you know what you're doing? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm cool, I'm cool. It's two channel, new mark, ain't that complicated. I'm like, yeah, you're right, just two channels. So he got the ear, you know, earphone, and uh, I went off, you know, relieve myself, give me a little break in, a little snack. This brother was amazing. I mean, I, I, I remember 
not even finishing my food that I had on my plate that I got. I was standing there with my mouth over watching him mix and scratch and phase. I'm like, Shazam! And I mean, he did it with such effortless, like just, man, it was just, I mean, the brother was amazing, man. This cat, this was his thing. Man, he mixed that music up, you know, and he scratched it. He had one song played about 15 minutes. Instrumental, acapella, rhythm. Man, I'm like, who is this guy? Oh, old boy showed his natural behind, man. He got on them turntables and went straight the hell off. Man. And I'm standing there. I ain't go up there because I wanted to listen and watch more, you know. And I stayed back there, man, about 45 minutes just watching and listening. You know, I'm just like, Shazam, this, woo. This guy was, man, he was good. Woo-wee. Then finally, I went over there. I said, look, dude, I ain't no DJ. He said, what do you mean? I said, shit, next to you, I don't know what I'm doing up here. I just got the equipment. <laughs> so, so he started laughing, you know. I said, dude, you gotta teach me that. He said, okay, no problem. We can hang out. And so, shown up, he come by my house and he teach me what scratching is, how to beat count the music, how to organize the music, teach him how to scratch, teach him how to mix. He teach me how to, how to, how to phase the music. Phasing is, is something, it's a beautiful sound. It's the way you pay, it's the way you play the exact song, same song. You have copies of the same song on each turntable and you put the music, the needle in the exact same spot on each record. And when you play the records like that, it like open up the stereo envelope and because you got these Technique 1200 which is two of the top turntables still to this day. They haven't beat the Technique 1200s. And they got that quart crystal to maintain that 33 and a third or that 45 exact. It don't shift, it don't drift, it be exact. And so you put these records on there in the same location, the exact same time beating everything, and then you buy by 0.5 increments, you just slowly adjust the speed on one of the records. Don't have to be two, be just one. And you slowly adjust the speed and it'll make a sound so beautiful, man. They call that phasing. These cats don't do this nowadays. See, I'm looking at these boys around here now and what it's about now is show, show, showmanship. You ain't got to have skills like what I'm telling you about phasing, scratching, meeting, mixing, beat counting, all that. You know, they have all that computerized now. You know, my, my son, my youngest son, he's an entertainer, you know. He's got a song out here in Israel. He does shows, and, and so he showed me this DJ uh, app studio, what have you, on his laptop. You know, he got two records going around, and it's all digitalized, computerized. You pull the song up and you don't, have, you don't need them skills when I'm telling you about. And I'm like, huh, this is the way y'all do it now. And so, you know, all we had was the best turntable on planet Earth, Technique 1200. And anybody that's a real old school DJ know that's it. When you're talking about Technique 12, you at the top of the tree right there. And then you had a two channel Newmark mixer, that's it. Bass, mid, and tre treble. And then, you, you know, you had your, your 32 band graphic equalizer, you had the QSC power amps or your Fisher power amps or whatever kind of amps you had. And then you had your, your speaker system. Depending on how large your show is, it could be three-way where you had bass and then you got them big QSCs or what type of amps running to your bass. You got the uh, three-way crossover, bass, mid, and high, sending them signals out. You know, you take that signal off of your, Q, your uh, QSC. I mean, you take that signal off your, your, uh, your graphic equalizer and you send it to your crossover 
and the crossover separate the bass mid and high frequency so you send the bass out to the bass amp and it goes to the bass speaker you send the mid out to the mid speaker and it goes to your mid speaker and you see the high end of treble over there to your tweeters now one thing about the tweeters back in the day y'all y'all probably don't know or didn't realize in atlanta when you pull up to a traffic light the way that they would uh measure the traffic is up on the wood uh pole was a device that sent out high frequencies beep, 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 beep. and and it registered when it bounced back off the car and that's the way the system could tell if traffic was out there. Those little bitty black and silver uh, devices was actually high-end piezo speakers. They were speakers, and they sent, and they could go something like thirty. Uh, uh-uh, it was it was uh, fifteen to forty thousand hertz. I mean, above 20,000, the human ear only hear between 20 on the low end and 20,000 on the high end. That's when you got good hearing. Most people start losing their hearing on the high end, you know, for various reasons. Especially the type of person that don't protect your ears. So anyway, those speakers will go to 40,000. Everything above 20, you getting up there where the dog can hear. After 20,000, human ear don't hear. You can't hear nothing after 20,000 so that's what dogs is at so anyway in Atlanta they had these high end tweeter speakers on the telephone pole at the, at the corners Mo- a lot of the corners downtown <laughs> so when I did the Vry and now I got this electronics down real good I started making my cables I started making my speakers I started making a lot of equipment and saved me goo gobs of money. I go buy the parts. Okay? And so when I made my three way system, I bought the three way crossover and you can adjust it at different crossover frequencies to, you know, make the sound the way you wanted it. So Sir Sir Vega came out. Sir Vega is a speaker that's still, you know, popular today. Not as popular, but I remember when Serving Vega came on the market, they was talking about how powerful their bass speaker is. It can never be burned out. And they gave you a guarantee that if you ever burn this speaker out, then replace it free of charge. And the advertisement that they did on this speaker, they soldered a 120 volt drop cord to the speaker terminals, plus and minus. And they took that drop cord and plugged it into the wall. They shot 120 volts, 60 hertz frequency across that subwoofer. Serving Vega, I'll never forget this. That's how they caught me up. I'm like, you know, first of all, don't know power amp put out no 120 volts of 50 hertz. You know what I'm saying? 16 amps, 15 amps. They don't put that kind of you know, power out, put or no amplifier, you'll burn the speakers up. And so that's how they advertised Surrey Vegas when they first came out the market. I was there, Atlanta, Georgia. And I saw the demonstration. They they soldered the terminals of the Surrey Vega bottom, the 12 inch bottom, to an uh, extension cord and plugged it into a 120 volt, 50, 60 hertz. I think it was a 15 amp, 14 amp wall socket. Plug the speaker into the wall and it set down. Man, it was so loud and powerful that your ears itch and your pants leg, you could feel your pants leg vibrating. I'm like, damn! Give me a set of them. So I bought them. Just the raw speaker, the cones, you know, the 12 inch. And I went, you know, and, and built my infinite baffle speaker and put my foam in there, the crossover, the protection, everything. I built it myself by hand, sanded it. It was a real nice speaker. And uh, hey, man, 
I went to work. I had them serving Vega Bottoms and also Club uh, Mr. V's out there on Camerton Road. They installed serving Vegas and they called their music Earthquake Sound because they had such incredible bass. And they had them big 12 inch in them cabinets up there. And the club was on uh, um, um, Mr. V's was, on, it was in a strip mall out on Camerton Road in Atlanta, Georgia. And they bragged about Earthquake Sound. And they was not lying. Mr. V's was on the end, the far end of a strip mall. And way down on the other end was a police precinct. And the police precinct, I mean, this is like almost 100 yards down there. Where this um, police precinct, how far it was away from the nightclub that we was in. Mr. V's, figure eight, disco, Camerton Road. And do you know when they fired up the bass speakers, them serving Vegas, they cranked them for a while, man. And the police came down there, asked us, will we please turn the bass down? This is all the way down there, damn near 100 yards. But you know, bass frequencies, it takes a lot of power to move them, right? But when you get bass frequencies moving, it'll vibrate. Then them boys like complain to us, would we please turn the bass down? And we had to pull back on the bass, man. That doggone serving Vega. Woo wee. And I got them and put them in my cabinets and I hit the road. They said I would always get the best sound in Atlanta. You know, if they did, when they did articles on me, they said Daryl Crowder, EMF Disco has the best sound in Atlanta. He's a mobile DJ. I remember this band came down from Chicago. We played in this club. And I was the DJ for intermission in between the band. And the head of the band, this brother came up. Uh, I think his name was Eliel. I think that was his name. And the band finished. And then I took over playing my music. You know, I'm a DJ and folks dance and have a good time. And uh, I never forget, I was up there in the DJ booth and see, because this was a nightclub. Okay, cool. The nightclub, they have their own in-house system. All you got to do is turn the system on, throw your records on there, and you bang it. But because of the fact that I built my system, and what, what was crazy, I had a three-speaker system, not four. And see, see, generally you have two speakers, one on one side and left and right, okay? And so they had the dance floor out there, and the average DJ, was normal DJ, would come in, and he put a speaker up on front, you know, right in front of the DJ booth, one on the left side, one on the right side, facing the audience. And so that means everybody up front would get blowed away, and people halfway and all the way to the back could just barely hear the song or it'd be at a decent volume. But in order to get to the people in the back, the ones up front got to die. You find what I'm saying? Like, just kill them. It's too loud, man. But what I did, I designed a three-speaker system. Two speakers up front on each side, left and right, and one support speaker in the back in the middle. And the support speaker in the back was biggest. You follow me? So that means I could lower the sound up front and the people up front would live and the people in the back still would be okay because they still hearing good sound. And the way that system worked is it reflected off the wall in the club, the floor, and the different item. And the sound was beautiful. It wasn't too loud. It wasn't too soft. It was loud enough to get you in the groove. The bass was banging. And, you know, because I've been told I have gifted ears, I can hear real well, you know, I had tuned the system to where you had that smooth, rich, deep bass, that punching mirror and them high, and the music was just beautiful, man. Then my voice come through. I wasn't like regular DJ. They hollering in the mic, yeah, we're going to get out, yeah. No, I would lower the volume on the music, 
and you listen to the station that moves the entire nation, moving to you just because we love you. Get up on the dance floor and move it like you've never done before. And then I bring the music back up. This brother that owned that band, he came up in the DJ booth and he just stood there. He kind of looked to the side. He just stood there and listened and what? And he came over to me. He said, bro, uh, somebody told me that was your system you playing on. It's not the, not the club system. I'm like, yeah, that's mine, my system. He said, really? I said, yep. Yeah. Why, you, why you ask? He said, brother, that music sound damn good. I have never heard sound that good in any clubs we played in. He said, brother, this stuff, this music sound good, man. Because I had the full range going, bass, mid, and high. You know, and I've, been, I've gotten that compliment several times because I do have gifted ears. I hear very well, you know. And, uh, yeah, so I was that guy back in the day. I was uh, 17, 17, 18. I graduated. I graduated high school at 17, and I was doing the DJ, the discos all over the place, and so I got into this here, and I'm going to let you go. Uh, I started renting the grand ballroom to different hotels around Atlanta, the Hilton, the Ramada, the Plaza, uh, the Holiday Inn, and every weekend, Friday night, I throw a big, you know, disco. All right, so like as an example, we rent the, the Hilton Grand Ballroom. You get a thousand people up in there sitting at the tables. You put all these tables in there and you still get a thousand people sitting at the table. You know how many people you can pack in there with no table standing up dancing? Two, three times that minute. But the fire marshal said a thousand, but they were never there to check. So. What I started doing, I started renting the ballroom like four or five hours. When you do it like that, you, you get a cheaper deal. But if you rent it for, uh, I think, 12 hours or something, it's, it's going to cost you more. And see, when you had companies come in and they was rent the places, then they was rent it for, for the long time because they need their folks to come in, decorate, food, get everything together. So they'd be up in there and it cost them a grip. Me, I only ran up in there and turned the lights on, set my equipment up, and lowered the lights. And I had a couple of beautiful sisters collecting the money. And so I rent the room for like four or five hours. I get away with like a fat rat, you know, hardly nothing compared to what I was making. And so I got this, um, I set my, you know, it was my system. I set the system up, records, everything, boom, you know, music off the chain. So... I would always have call them beer blasts, you know, Earth Union, I mean, uh, EMF beer blasts, you know. And so um, I would go out to the Coors place and get that cheap keg beer. And, you know, when you go to the uh, the beer dealers, it, it, it'd, be, it, it'd be several different type beers you could buy. And I bought the keg. And I remember getting the, the keg beer. And when you get the keg beer, it's a better taste. It's cheap, but it's still a better taste. So you can get away with with saving some money, but still the taste is good because it's a keg and you keep it at the same temperature. So since it was a hotel, you know, they had those mobile bars that you put the keg in with the tap. And we went over to the paper place and I got several thousand of those cups. I think it was a 12 ounce cup. And, and you know, all the kegs of beers, I think we got about 15, 20 kegs, something like that, whatever. And the cups, I had the kegs in the frit, frit, refrigerator back there, and we had 10, 12 mobile bars out on the floor all the way around the walls. And, man, the music had chairs around the wall in case somebody might want to sit from dancing. You, you, know, you always want to sit, take a little break. And I had the stage set up. Where I was set up, I had the two 1200 Technique Newmark mixer, my little stuff, amps and all that, and boom, big sound, banging. And we advertised. I would advertise the week, WLK Radio back in the day, and then V103, 
WVEE V103 FM. And so we advertise, you know, wasn't no Facebook, wasn't no Instagram, wasn't none of that. You know, this is like 70, 79, 80, 70, 78, 79, 80, like that, you know. And um, that's the way we did it. So I go up in there, set up, take no time, me and my boy, set the equipment up. Sisters show up to collect that money. And Circuit City was an electrical, uh, electronic store. Like today, you got Best Buy. Some of y'all remember Circuit City. Circuit City and Best Buy, the same thing. They saw all different kind of electronics. And back in those days, you remember we had those boom boxes, those cassette players and big box speakers, you know, mobile, you know. So I had some brothers worked out at Circuit City and they would bring me a boom box. So what I did in the party, you got over a thousand, maybe 2,000 people in the, in the party. And the way I did it, instead of, you know, uh, taking the money and say you can't leave, I would take the money and they would stamp the back back of your hand. The sisters, when they collect the money, they would stamp the back of your hand with this uh, invisible ink that you can only see it under the UV. And you could pay and go in or you turn around and leave. But when you come back, all you had to do was show you that back of the hand stamp. You can go in because you paid. The reason why I did that is because it allowed way more people to pass through that door than, we ha than, than, the, ro than the room could feel. Because, you know, a lot of people like to go outside or <clears throat> back in those days, people used to bar hop, go from place to place. And if you had the situation going where people couldn't leave, they wouldn't mess with you like that. Because, you know, hey, that was part of the fun. You know, you pop up over here, you go to Earth Union. You know, you go to uh, my my party and then you go over to uh, the warehouse over there. <clears throat> or you could maybe somebody having a house party you heard about. So you want to move around. Right. But at the same time, that allowed me to continuously collect money for for the whole time we was there because the place never was jam-packed where you couldn't get nobody in there it was full but it wasn't so slam packed people could go out get a little breath fresh air whatever come back in man thousand people and i charged 25 dollars at the door you gave away all free beer all you could drink and then the box that the brother brought from circuit city I had a table and a light that I would set it up on. And I did this at every party. And the the uh, the uh, the box, I would raffle it off in the party. <clears throat> I started selling the tickets at 9 o'clock. I'm on the mic talking, you know, whatever I'm saying. The pump up, the sales. And I was selling $5 raffle tickets. I had girls floating around the store. I mean, floating around the floor selling tickets to people while they dance. Some people stopped dancing, buy a ticket. And then I had a sister sitting right next to the thing up front, next to the DJ on the stage with me, you know, and then the girls at the door were selling raffle tickets. And so we started selling at 9 o'clock and 12, we're going to call the ticket out, right, the, the winner. So between 11.30 and, and 11.45, right up to 12 midnight, where I sold incredible amounts of tickets. $5 a pop, that's it, just $5. And this box is worth a couple hundred dollars. So everybody knew they was getting a deal and you was going to get the box that night because I'm going to call it 12 midnight, the winner number, right? And then present them in a box right there on stage, man. That became such an incredible draw that people would come to the party just to go through that experience of, of buying them tickets in the party to see who get the box. Oh, man. <laughs> First time I made this 25 plus on the door. And then we make another two, three, four thousand on ticket sales, five dollars a pop, raffling this box. And I was like 17, 18, man. Young buck. Did that every night. I never forget for a year. The only time I worked was Friday night at the hotel doing that four or five hours. And I come out thirty thousand, thirty four, thirty five thousand dollars every single day night that I did that Friday night and, and and that's all I did I worked one night a week four hours five hours 
And, and I got so big that I never even picked up any equipment. I've, I've hired guys to do that for me. I had young brothers that they knew to set up. They knew everything. You know, they was, they was real good sons. They, you know, same my age, you know, I'm talking about son, but you know, brothers wanted to make some money. And I took care of my people, man. They paid them boys $100 to do that stuff. You know what $100 was back then? Woo! And, and it wasn't that hard at work. I mean, what? Sound. You know how it is. Party, man. You have a good time, care a few records. <laughs> you make $100, set up, and then you party all night. And for them, everything's free. And then they pack it up and go home, you know? And I vanned it up, put it in the van, and, you know, you leave all the equipment in the truck. So... Only time you take it out is when you ride up to your next location or next week to another hotel and uh, you unpack it. They did and set it up and then they break it down, put it back in the van, drive home. Man, I was making that kind of loot at that age. I just, some days I look back, man, I say to myself, man, what if I'd have had some mentor or someone around me that I respect enough to help me to understand how to deal with the money. You know, I, I could have taken that money and invested in other things that I had no idea was real. I could have bought stocks. I mean, just, just as a quick example, I'm, I'm living in the house with my mother, like 18 years old. I don't have no family, no children, no financial responsibility. I don't know nobody. And I'm walking through the door with like $35,000, $37,000. My mother knew I was doing the party, but she never knew how much money I was making. She didn't ask. I didn't tell her. But that was kind of loot I was walking around with. Then get up, you know, Monday, go put uh, put it all in the bank. I got a car. I don't need no money. You know what I'm saying? I got away from Jimmy and that stupid $800 they, you know, we, and, and that's what I did, man. I did that job for one solid year. I remember when I was 18 years old and that's all I did for a whole year was party. And I'll never forget one night I was riding along there and I said to myself, damn, my whole life is number one big party. <laughs> you know, cause it's like everything I did was fun. Nothing I did was painful. Nothing I did was stressful. Nothing I did, you know, was just, you know, everything was just nice. Everywhere I went, everybody I dealt with, everything I did was just joyful, you know. And I went to the best restaurant in Atlanta. It was on top of the, uh, name that hotel, the, the tallest, it was, at the time it was the tallest hotel in the world, the round one. Is that the Peace Street Plaza? I forgot the name of it. But uh, it's that round hotel in Atlanta. It's real tall up there. That was my favorite restaurant. And it was high end back in those days. I don't know what they're doing now, but back in those days, that bad boy was top dog. And I mean, I used to go up there every single weekend with a different sister. And they had five servers, I remember. You know, uh, I had this real beautiful cashmere coat jacket that I would wear, you know, pants, nice pants. We shopped at George Muse. George Muse in those days was like Joseph A. Bank, Joseph A. Banks today. It was a clothier for men. You know, back then they called him haberdashery. Now they call him George H. Muse, uh, uh, Joseph A. Banks clothiers. Okay. But that's, that's where you buy high-end clothes, you know, for men and women. And they like $200 pants. I bought, when I jumped back to the States in 2012 for a minute, uh, I shopped up there. I bought like several pair of pants, $225. Shirts, $100. Ties were 70 some dollars Socks, $15, you know. But all this stuff is high-end. or It's like the kind of stuff you don't see but on executives, you know, big money people, people got the money. I mean, $225, you shoot out to Walmart, grab your fair pair of pants off the shelf, a few dollars, you gone. 
Yeah, but that's where I used to shop at, right? And so I used to go up to this restaurant in this beautiful cashmere coat. Change up the pants, you know, you got khakis, you got executive, you got, you know, you change. But I used to like that coat, right? So when I go up to this restaurant, we done party, have a ball and everything. And so it's Saturday night when I go. Cause I did my parties on Friday. So I take my girls up to this restaurant on Saturday. It's the Sundial Restaurant. That's the name of the restaurant. It's the Sundown Restaurant. I think that hotel, the Peace Street Plaza, that's the name of that restaurant. The Sundial, because why? It's a round hotel, and up at the very top is the restaurant bar. And when I would go up there, my favorite table was 9A. I never forget this, man. You see, you know, I mean, like I'm 60 right now. And I was sitting up there at this table when I was 18 years old, and the table was 9A reserved for Daryl Crowder. Y'all don't even know, man. Y'all don't even know. Man, I'm telling you. <laughs> Woo! You know, I ain't thought about this in a long time. I'm telling you, because you, you know, I told you I was going to let you in and get to know me and my life. So I'm 18 years old, sitting up at the Sundial restaurant at my favorite table, 9A, with my beautiful date over there. And pocket filled with kizaz. I don't know. I, you know, I'm going to tell you, you may not believe it, but 30000 was easy for me all the time. 20000 25000 that's the kind of cash I walk around with all the time, you know, at that age. Because that's what I was doing, them shows. I ain't need no money. I took all that to the house. I paid my people good, took care of everybody, tipped everybody, everybody slap happy, waiting on another show. And I go home and chill. So I'm sitting up there with my date at the Sundial restaurant, my favorite table, 9A. And, and 9A was a beautiful little quaint table right by the window. And for those of you all that know, you know the Sundial rest, restaurant. And for those of you all that don't know, this is a restaurant that was built on a turntable. The whole restaurant floor, the seats where all the other patrons are sitting, it moves around real slowly. I used to remember exactly how long it takes to make a full circle around that building. Hour and a half, two hours, something. But you, you, you can see it. You sitting right there and you can see the wall moving real slow right by it. That job was nice. And so that'll give you a chance to see the whole city of Atlanta, state of Georgia, as far as I can see. And so that was my spot, 9A. I had a hostess, a server, a maitre d', a wine steward, a bread steward. So I sit down with my date. Then the hostess come over, introduce herself or himself, whoever it may be for that night, and give us the, the wine menu, the drink menu first. And when you open it, the very first wine on that list, the very first drink was Don Perignon. It was $110 a bottle. i never forget this. I did this every weekend, man. And so, you know, I'm trying to be impressive to my date. So I said, yes, I'll, I'll take the uh, bottle of Don Perignon. And so the server bring it out, you know, <laughs> go through the whole little glass, cork, you know, whatever like that. And you know the procedure. Now, because I went up there every weekend, practically, four weeks in and a month, I knew I was up there three of them, guaranteed, no bull. Those people knew me. They knew my name, first and last name. And they knew them girls that I was bringing up there were not, it was just dates. But they was professional. Because this is high end. And so, you know, they knew what I wanted. And they knew how to big me up in front of the girl like, you know, he's a special customer. Mr. Crowder, would you like your regular? Mr. Crowder this, Mr. Crowder that. Oh, man, this is crazy, boy. This, this, is, this is madness, man. Mr. Crowder this, Mr. Crowder that, you know. And she's sitting over there. You see the sparkle in her eye. And, you know, I'm just like, the man, <laughs> Mr. Crowder. Uh, well, Mr. Crowder, would you like the regular? I say, yep, I'll take that. And the regular was uh, flound flounder fish from the freshwater streams of North Georgia stuffed with crab cake. That was my floating in butter. 
Oh, that was my favorite, man. That was my favorite. Flounder fish stuffed with crab cake, and the flounder was from the north, from the freshwater streams of North Georgia. That's what they say. You know what I mean? I mean, like, it's a restaurant, so we know how they get out, but that's what they said, you know. So she eat whatever she wanted. And uh, we started off with the Dome Perignon. She said, ooh, I, every sister I took up there said they ain't never had any Dome Perignon. A $110 bottle, I guess you may not have, you know. And so we start, and then, you know, they had a big crock pot full of those jumbo shrimp. I ain't talking about no shrimp like, you know, you go to the Walmart and get no shrimp. These buses look like whales up in there. And this was the appetizer. They bring it out with the sweet and sour sauce, the butter, whatever. And then you had this tall crock pot and this shrimp be on the ice, you know, and that's what you eat. Because, like, if you run up in there and you hungry now, you don't really want to be waiting till your meal get ready. Because, you know, they prepare meals as you order. They didn't have shit sitting up there like the hamburger joint waiting on you to show up. And so they bring the big crock pot of shrimp out. And you can sit there and eat your shrimp and drink your uh, Dom Perignon and talk your bullshit get it. Man, the sister was ready to get down right then. All that right there done knocked her out. But, hey, you know, to my left were the booth. Okay, you had the table right by the window. You had the aisle. And then over there on the other side of the aisle were booths. Like, you get nine or ten people up. There was a half-moon booth facing us. And see, everything was facing the window so you can see. Do you know, and this is no stretching the truth, I'm not lying. I don't have to lie. You just enjoy listening. Do you know practically, and the reason why I'm saying practically, I'm saying a high percentage of the time that I went to that restaurant, there was this dude sitting over there in that booth. He was a big guy, but like a big, big, big uh, Italian guy. Remind me of Big Mob Boss, black hair. He sitting there with both arms on the table, and he had people all around him. I go there, it'd be like family members, look like you know, children, wives, and then you know, go there another time, be all dudes sitting up there, they talking. Go there another time, it'd be you know, look like family, but it's just like man, damn, every time I come here, that dude there, and so it happened so much that I remember one time I was bending backwards, stretching. I was, I was, I was stretching, <clears throat> and I happened to look over there at him. And then when I was bent backwards stretching, I looked and saw him, and he he looked like he was looking at me. And as I was bent backwards over the chair stretching, get a good stretch, I waved at him, and he threw his hand up, waved, nodded his head. And so after that, every other, every time that I would go, if he was there, I wave at him. He'd wave and nod his head and smile, and and it's like. After that, we, we kind of built up a little, you know, you know, he kind of had his little energy. He got his group. I got my group. Oh, my girl. My girl was always different one. His people would change. But then I began to see them children and them women, like maybe his family, more than once. You know what I'm saying? So we had us a little connection there. I never said nothing to him. He never said nothing to me. Remember, I told you, I used to go to that restaurant for a year. And that was like when I was doing that DJ. Man, please. Brother was balling. You know, one night, um, we did a show. And and I used to keep a um, cooler, a beer in my trunk. Like the big cooler. I mean, the huge cooler. You could, big buster. Packed full of ice. <clears throat> I used to get the ice from the hotels down there at Fort Industrial Boulevard. I used to go down. I ain't buy that ice. I used to go down there and put on some shorts, flip flops. In a, in a colorful shirt back in those days, they called them Nick Nicks. The Nick Nick shirt was real colorful. It was like you just came from the island somewhere. And so I put that shit on and go down there with my cooler and walk up in the hotel and go up and down the floors and, and get that ice and fill up my cooler. And so when I came down out of the hotel, i never forget one day I was to see the security guards, they had to keep you from taking whatever, you know, and so the security guard was at the front door, and I looked. I said, oh, snap, security here. I wasn't a person of the hotel, but I looked like I could have been staying there. It was summertime. 
you know, you had Six Flags over George down the street, and you had a lot of guests that would travel there and stay at them hotels and go to Six Flags. So, you you know, it's really, they don't know. I look the part. I got my shorts on. I got my flip flop flop. I got my Nick Nick shirt on, and I got a big cooler. So it looked like I'm going to Six Flags. And so I, I, it's half full of ice, and I'm saying, oh, snap, security standing there. So I walk up to the door. He looked at me. I look at him. He look at me. I look at him. He look at the cooler. I look at him. I see him looking at the cooler. I look at him. He look at me. I say, would you open that door for me, sir? He said, oh, yes, no problem. So he jumps right over and opened the door. I said, thank you. And I walk right out, put the cooler in my car, and I'm gone. Then I go over to the beer store, the package store, and I fill it up with beer. And that's where I used to roll. But I ain't going to tell you about when I used to sell beer in the park on Sunday, because in Georgia, on Sunday, Georgia's a dry state, right? You couldn't, see, couldn't buy beer. But I would sell beer in the park on Sunday. I tell you, that's something different. <laughs> Oh, I told y'all, you say you're going to, you want to get to know me. So here you go. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, man, <laughs> me and old big, big dude, uh, he, he probably was mafia. I don't know. He looked mafia mob boss. Son. Oh, he could have just been a guy, you know what I'm saying? That liked to dress and look the part like me. I always like to look good, you know? So <clears throat> I would take these sisters up there, be different girls every week. And, uh, I never forget the old service was absolutely good, man. And and okay, so we eat, we done did the shrimp appetizer, we done drank the wine, and then the main course come out, and then you had a bread, you know, steward. They they rolled this table with like three, four, five shells of different type breads on it, and then you could pick the bread. Me, I like soft bread. I don't like no hard bread. I don't like no hard, you know. Uh, edges around the bread, soft in the middle. I like soft bread, 100% whole wheat. And the breads would be warm, like they just brought it out the oven. And so I would get me a nice warm bread and the, and the bread server would put the, 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 uh, the wood cutter on the table and slice it up to the thickness that you want. And man, that knife was sharp. It, whew, I like just a Shazam, that's a sharp knife. So he would slice it up, and then he laid a knife. He sliced half of the loaf, right, and then laid a knife on the side in case they, you needed to slice some more. And the bread, Stuart went on. Then they had the uh, maitre d' come through, check on everything, and then the, the guy serenade you, you know, with the little violin. He coming through, yeah, and he's standing there over your table, and he's standing there, you and her together, and y'all look like you, you know what I'm saying, and you're supposed to have this. And so he's standing there with the violin, and this is blowing his sister's mind, right? And so I take a $100 bill out, and while he playing, you understand, I take the $100 bill and just push it down in his vest pocket. Oh, but he's standing there and playing serenade us, and he's just serenading, he's standing there, and the sister's like, ooh, baby, this is so nice. She said, ooh, Daryl, I'm impressed. I said, you are? She said, with what? She said, just the way you is. <laughs> and so the guy, he serenaded for a while. Then I nod my head, and he walk on, strolling around the room. And they knew if I gave him $100, you know what he done collected through that whole little place right there. Man, please. Oh, boy, I used to enjoy that. <sighs> yeah, and then when we leave, you know, oh. Uh, one thing about those servers, they was real attentive. You know what I'm saying? Like your host, hostess, a host, you know, they would always watch you. They wouldn't just like go. If you needed something, you know, all you had to do was like look around, like you look like you looking for them, zoom. They're going to send the waiter up there or they're going to pop up. Can we get you anything, sir? They be right on it, man. And so... I said, yeah, I need another bottle of this Dawn Perignon. Right away, sir. And it was just like that. Right away, the, the, the server, he coming out with it. Your fresh bottle, he go through the whole thing, you know, boom, you know, we drink it. And so we done ate. We working on this bottle now. So we chilling. This ain't the kind of restaurant to run your ass up out of there when you get to, when you, when you still chewing the last bite. Bounce, some people out there waiting. No, no, no. They ain't like that, partner. Because you know how much that dinner cost me? $250 for the dinner. The bottles of wine was $110. We had two. How much is that? 
Huh? Yeah, buddy. That's what I was dropping. 250 for the food. Another 110 for the wine. That's 360. And then another 110 for another bottle of wine. But check this out. It went over with. When I got ready to leave, once you pay for the meal, you know, the hostess come, get the money, take it, da 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 da. And they sharp. They know if you pay cash, they're going to give you as many small bills they can. One, five, tens, and twenties. Why? Because when you have them small bills like that, it's easier for you to pick a tip out of them. You don't give back big bills, hundreds and fifties, because they may not want to tip you fifty. You know what I'm saying? So they will come with the change and it will be change. One dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever, whatever you give them, you know. And so after that, when all of your servers see that you paid, they will go line up by the door. Cause they know you're getting ready to go. So they would line up by the door and that's where you get them the tips on the way out. And so they never say anything to the woman, but how you doing, ma'am? They would probably compliment the dress. They say, how you doing, ma'am? I really like that dress. Or if it's a woman in the server crew, she said, oh, I really love those shoes. You know, just a compliment. That's all they would do. Compliment the woman with her dress, her hair, or shoe, but they never would say nothing to her, no conversation, no name, none of that, because that's that's against the rule. Because they see plainly this is a different woman from last week. They ain't forgot. So they don't talk to her because they don't want to bust you out and do something stupid. And so anyway, they would line up and I would tip all them fifty dollars on the way out the door, and it was five of them. You know what I'm saying? That was another 250 right there. Tipping them. The dinner was 250. That's 500 and 210 dollar bottle of wine. Huh? So what are we talking about? 500, 200, 720 dollars right there for that dinner. Yeah, buddy. Picked that. It was balling, man. I had a ball. Yeah, okay. That's enough. I, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. I've been talking to you long enough. It's been interesting. Don't forget to subscribe. You know, so you can hear some more of these delicious stories <laughs> and smile with me as I reminisce about growing up in Atlanta. All right. Listen, but hey, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy talking to you and you enjoy listening. So go ahead and um, know for sure to that. I love you. I love you from the basement of my heart to the attic of my mind. I love you 24-7. That means I love you all the time. Shalom.